I'd like to begin our meeting with a land acknowledgement. I'd like to recognize that Ottawa is located on unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe host nation. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe nation have lived on this territory for millennia. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. The Ottawa Police Services Board honors the peoples and the land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Today, Ottawa is home to approximately 40,000 First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Ottawa's indigenous community is diverse, representing many nations, languages and customs. The Ottawa Police Services Board honors all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. We are currently broadcasting on Zoom and live streaming on YouTube. Given this meeting is being held electronically, I want to caution that there is a possibility of technical, technical difficulties and I apologize, we did have a few technical difficulties and that's why we're starting a little bit later. Should we receive any other disruptions, I would ask that everyone remain patient as we work to fix the issue and resume the meeting as soon as possible. Now, before proceeding to the agenda, we will hold an election for a committee chair, as this committee does not currently have one. Member Curry, as the other member of this committee, do you have a nomination? I nominate you. <laughs> Thank you, Member Curry. I'm happy to chair this committee. I would like to note that we are missing a third member of this committee, and my term will expire when a new citizen appointee is selected by council. So there will be an opportunity in the future for another member of this board to chair this committee, should they be interested. I will now proceed with the confirmation of the agenda that the Finance and Audit Committee confirm the agenda of the 15th of February, 2023 meeting. Is the agenda confirmed? Confirmed. Thank you, Member Curry. Confirmation of minutes. Minutes number 18 of November 10th, 2022, that the Ottawa Police Services Board confirm minutes number 18 of the 10th of November, 2022 meeting. Are the minutes confirmed? Confirmed. Thank you. Declaration of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? I see none. Thank you. All right. Items of business now. The 2023 draft operating and capital budgets delegations. We have a presentation from staff on this item, and this will be followed by delegations. We will end with questions and comments from committee and board members. At this time, I will turn things over to you, Chef, for the presentation. À vous la parole. Merci, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I will just wait for the screen to be shared. Very good. Thank you very much. Our, our team is pleased to be here today to review the draft uh, 2023 Ottawa Police Service Budget. Uh, we look forward to receiving feedback from the board. Uh, city councillors and members of the public. Um, given most of you have seen our presentation on February 1st when we submitted the, the draft budget uh, to the board and later uh, at City Hall, uh, we will present uh, a shorter version today to ensure there's enough time uh, for questions. The OPS, uh, we remain committed in supporting the board as it fulfills its important role of approving uh, the 2023 budget. As such, um, the budget will ensure uh, the continued ability of OPS to provide adequate and effective policing in the city of Ottawa, while also demonstrating an efficient use of police resources and taxpayer dollars. As well, the submitted draft budget uh, was built in a way that complies with the board's 23 budget related directions, motions and resolutions. The 23 budget uh, process has involved and will continue to involve a substantial level of engagement with community members and has also included board delegations, surveys, focus groups, and other forms of uh, community feedback. The process has also involved uh, ex extensive internal reviews and efficiency efforts that has touched every command, directorate, and section of the organization. A wide variety of OPS employees have made direct contributions to the budget submission. Uh, the draft budget will contribute, contribute uh, to the needed investments for OPS to continue uh, the implementation of its multi-year plan for 
cultural change, and improved service delivery. Changes and improvements that were requested by board members, community members, and OPS members. The end state vision of the budget is to build a police service where every community member and every service employee feels respected, supported, protected, and accepted, no matter their background, status, or circumstances. This budget will position the service to build on this vision and meet the needs of the community and members in the future. I, again, I want to thank uh, the OPS team uh, for their leadership, uh, and in particular, uh, Deputy Chief Steve Bell. Uh, he assumed the duties of uh, the CAO in the new year and has led a team that has quickly and effectively completed the necessary work to get us here today. So thanks, uh, Steve, for taking on that role and, uh, and getting that work done. And you've got a great team behind you as well. I also want to thank uh, all board, OPS, and community members who meaningfully contributed to the development of the draft OPS 2023 budget. Next slide, please. Uh, this draft budget was uh, constructed uh, in consideration of the board's four strategic priorities that, that are on the screen now. Uh, these priorities were established in 2019, and we look forward to working with the board in the coming weeks uh, to develop or refresh the present strategic plan um, and reviewing these priorities. Next slide, please. Well, I won't uh, review all the critical data points that uh, were brought forward during our uh, February 1st presentation. Uh, I do want to restate a few numbers just for the, uh, the purpose of today's session. Uh, from a staffing per perspective, OPS ranked eighth out of the 12 uh, larger uh, police services when considering police to population rates in 2021. With that number, uh, adding to the, the time demands of our members that is really unique to the Ottawa Police Service is the high number of protests and major events that other police agencies uh, simply don't have to uh, manage within their communities given uh, you know, we're the capital of Canada. And as well, as mentioned uh, a few weeks ago, we do have the largest ge geographic landmass amongst the municipal police agencies uh, for our members to patrol and respond to calls. Also on this page is our CSI from 2021. And as you can see, um, we have the fifth lowest crime severity index amongst uh, the Canada's big 12. Um, however, we do believe again, when uh, the 22 numbers are coming out, it will be elevated uh, by 13% to 55.5. Whether to further invest in policing has been a topic for some in Ottawa. Um, we do wanna point out again that the OPS budget as a total percentage of, uh, of the whole city of Ottawa budget has been decreasing uh, from 9.7% uh, in 2017. Um, and this year, if, uh, if, if the present budget is passed, it'll be down to 8.9%. Another challenge of note is inflation. Um, historically, we budget for about a $1 million or 2% inflationary uh, pressure uh, every budget. However, last year in 2022, it was almost triple at a $2.8 million pressure to our budget, which we expect to continue uh, in 2023 and makes up a significant portion of the proposed funding increase. This slide here has a number of key policing statistics uh, going in the wrong direction, unfortunately. Um, our calls for service are up to 346,000. Um, this re uh, represented a return to the pre-pandemic call levels. Um, and was 3% higher than 2021. Our Criminal Code of Canada offences uh, at around 43,000 increased 19% in 2022. And just, you know, with that COVID bump, you don't know what uh, numbers are, but over a five-year average, uh, last year was about 10% higher, um, again, over that five-year average. And, you know, unfortunately, overnight, uh, we just experienced our third homicide of 2023. It's a concerning start to the year, uh, for sure, but obviously this is going to uh, contribute to uh, um, to these numbers as well. And again, another number here, as I just mentioned, uh, our CSI is expected to uh, rise to about 55.5. Uh, property crime, we all know that the theft of motor vehicles is, uh, is an epidemic uh, in the province of Ontario. Um, we're not immune to that here in Ottawa. We are taking steps to try to curb that, uh, um, that trend from going up, but it is certainly something that um, uh, we're very concerned about. I have mentioned, uh, you know, in previous meetings, my focus is on the front line so we can uh, respond to these calls for service in a timely manner and importantly find some proactive time uh, to target uh, prolific offenders are our uh, areas that uh, create the most uh, violence the most uh, calls for service um, where there's been a, a significant increase in, in crime next slide please 
So the highlights uh, of the budget, uh, again, that do align with the police board's uh, directions. It, it does include an allocation of 25 uh, new full-time equivalent positions. Uh, 20 will be sworn, five on the civilian side, uh, you know, as part of a four-year staffing uh, a plan that will see a hiring of 100 new members. We are uh, focusing on public events and uh, demonstrations, looking at different uh, staffing models, a lot more agency collaboration, and, uh, and, and attempting to uh, secure more permanent funding for that particular part of our work. Um, the delivery uh, uh, on commitments made in the facilities uh, strategic plan, and specifically the advancement of the South facility project uh, is part of this budget. Um, and again, uh, we got new and some ongoing investments in uh, some of the strategic priorities that we mentioned that promote equity, uh, diversity and inclusion. And that will include a new three-year plan for our EDI uh, and of course in advancing our safe workplace office. We do have other initiatives that align with a lot of community feedback that includes uh, refining our police, our neighborhood policing strategy, uh, new approaches to mental health calls and, uh, and an increased investment in, in hate crime. So I'll leave it at that and I will uh, turn it over to Deputy Chief Bell. Steve. Uh, thanks, Chief, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so the table in front of you highlights the breakdown of the 2023 gross operating budget. As you can see, it has a 2.5% tax levy that supports operating and capital requirements for the OPS to ensure that we can deliver adequate and effective policing. 83% of all of our budget is allocated to compensation. That includes the cost of members moving through their salary steps, as well as provisions for negotiated pay increases and officer growth. 8% of this budget is allocated towards materials, supplies, and services that include things like fuel for our fleet, uniform and safety supplies for members, uh, maintenance for facilities and IT infrastructure, as well as required training and development and professional services. 6% of the total budget is allocated to capital formation, which supports life cycle and infrastructure related costs for fleet, IT, and equipment related costs to support the delivery of adequate and effective policing. The final 3% is attributed to city related support costs, such as program facility costs and other related support services where the OPS and the city are integrated. Next slide, please. Uh, the table in front of you here breaks down the $15.2 million in the 2023 draft operating budget increase and is categorized in accordance with the City of Ottawa budget reporting requirements. We've allocated $12.3 million for investments needed to maintain services and to ensure continued delivery of adequate and effective police service. $3.4 million is allocated to the 25 member growth supporting priorities and strategic direction for OPS and included in that will be 20 growth officers allocated to the front line, as well as five growth civilian positions to support operations. $600,000 is being allocated towards budget priorities outlined by the chief. Uh, 400,000 of that going to digital information and evidence management systems that will support, um, support the infrastructure to look at a body-worn camera pilot. And $200,000 will be allocated to begin to stand up a cyber crime unit. Uh, OPS has continued to committed to seeking ways to reduce operating costs while achieving our core objectives. In the 2023 budget, we've included $500,000 of efficiencies. The user fee increase aligns to the board user policy and ensures that user fees grow at the same pace as costs. This budget also aligns to the motion approved by the board, which waives fees for all volunteer background checks for the duration of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So this table highlights the 2023 capital envelope that ensures assets such as fleet facilities and information technology replaced as required. The $600 million, sorry, yes, $60 million, not 600, $60 million is allocated uh, based on two categories. The first is a renewal of assets, which includes fleet, uh, facilities, life cycle, information technology infrastructures, and the life cycle of other specialized assets. And the second area is around strategic initiatives that includes areas like the South facility that makes up the majority of this category and growth over the year. So I'm gonna now turn it over, if we go to the next slide, I'm gonna now turn it over to uh, Executive Director John Steinbeck to go through the feedback mechanisms. Hi, uh, good morning, thanks, thanks uh, uh, DC Bell for that. So I, I just, before we get into some of the budget feedback, um, uh, 
directly. I, the, I just want to remind the board that throughout the year, OPS is involved in a number of different activities to ensure we're listening to the community. Um, our NRTs are out there. Our RBI unit is, is out there talking to people regularly. There's a number of one-on-one -on -one conversations, group dialogue, surveys, questionnaires, and discussions generally that we use to inform these, these discussions throughout the year. Um, one area, like most organizations, we put an extra emphasis on reaching out directly to some of the groups that that are not traditionally represented in traditional um, uh, survey survey methods. So then we resort to a lot of one on one conversations or or dialogues with specific groups. Um, in the, the the last bullet there just gives you a sense of some of the discussions that Dave, uh, Superintendent Zacharias's team has been doing through the year. Um, talking to different groups about their views on policing, the types of needs they have, the changing uh, role of, of police in society, um, uh, et cetera, that they they uh, they want to see from us. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So the budget feedback process. So th this is uh, this kind of outlays where we are and some of the key things that are going on. Um, on the first of February, we posted a budget feedback survey or a questionnaire online. That that provides some open ended questions for people to respond to. Um, I'll I'll talk about that in a second. Um, uh, DC Bell is is going uh, door to door on Councillors Row and speaking to city councillors and the mayor's office about their views. I think this is a good opportunity this year. That I know that a lot of the the councillors have just well, obviously they've just finished the election campaign, and that is a great way to get feedback. Uh, going to door to door, so. We're, I know that we're, he's hearing a lot of really good information from, from uh, city councillors as he visits them. Um, as I said, we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one outreach initiatives in, with Indigenous, racialized, marginalized community stakeholders and community groups. That's ongoing. We've engaged a number of uh, all, all of our senior officers to reach out to their contacts, um, and, and we continue that work. Uh, of course, that work is going to continue into next week. Um, Obviously, we're here today for the delegations, and we're all eager to hear the delegations and from any city councillors who are here as well. Uh, next slide, slide please. Um, again, I, I just want to stress that along with some of the more traditional methods that we've used over the years, we, we have a heavy focus on reaching uh, groups that are not traditionally represented in traditional surveys. And uh, that work is is underway, and that the the list on the screen is are just some of the, some of the groups that we've reached out to. Um, that work is still ongoing, and and we're hoping to have reached them all by by next week. Um, this this is really a work in process in, in progress. Uh, the next pl slide, please. Uh, these were the online questions. I'll just pause for a second. I don't know if. if um, Board members have had a chance to see them, but it just gives you a flavor that th this year we took an approach to leave things very open ended for people to be able to comment. It's very reflective um, of what the city of Ottawa is doing. Uh, we we uh, with their own questionnaire. I'll just give you a second to have a quick look. So and and so currently the 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 uh, as you can see we have more than four hundred we're closing in I think on five hundred responses. That's uh, I would say that's very high if you consider how many people would respond. Let's say between twenty ten and twenty twenty. Oftentimes we get less than two dozen comments, uh, but it's it's uh, not as high as we would have seen in the twenty twenty one budget process. But there's still several days. I believe it's still open until uh, February 20th, and we're advertising it every day on a number of different platforms. I, I think on this morning, I think I saw it on Facebook and Twitter, and we're also reaching out directly to community groups to ensure that their people are aware that this is a way to uh, uh, to provide feedback. Uh, next slide, please. So. Um, the the sum total of this is the budget feedback is we're we're, we're going to be writing a report. Um, as, uh, I think on Thursday we're starting to finish it off, um, and it will be part of the February board agenda. So so the board will see this report on the twenty fourth, I believe, or the twenty third. It'll be next Wednesday anyway. Sorry, I don't have the exact date, but on next Wednesday the the document will be posted. It will have a summary of the feedback questionnaire. It will have a summary of the the discussions we've had with councillors and and mayor um, and the mayor consultations. Uh, we're also monitoring. We have staff monitoring and attending the city consultations 
throughout the, I know that some of the counselors um, uh, who are on the board have been having their own consultation. So we are attending those as well to hear some feedback. And there is some feedback about police there. Uh, last year, I believe it was May and June last year, we participated in Advanis polling. Um, and that's a regular uh, survey that's done across the country that measures um, um, views towards police services. We again participated. That information will be part, including the entire survey, will be a part of the Wednesday um, of the budget feedback report. Um, we're also going to just to remind the board, we've got some surveys and some other studies from previous years. It's a little bit dated, but we still think it's consistent. It's around the year 2020 around our member survey and some other studies that we think the board would 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 find interesting as it as it considers the uh, budget for the final deliberation. Um, that's the end of the uh, feedback uh, portion, and uh, I'll hand it back over to, I believe, the chief. Uh, thank you, John. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Madam Chair, that uh, concludes our presentation and uh, now ready to take any feedback and or questions. Thank you very much, Chef, and thank you to your staff as well, your team, for a very good presentation, very informative. Uh, before, we go, before we go to questions from the committee, we will hear from the registered delegations. Each delegate will have up to five minutes to speak. Members of this committee and board members, please let me know if you have questions or comments for the delegations before us today by raising your hand. As a reminder, all delegates are required to abide by our procedural guidelines. This includes refraining from using unparliamentary language and speaking disrespectfully of any person. It also means focusing your comments on the draft 2023 Ottawa Police budget. Failure to follow these guidelines will result in your delegation being curtailed. So I will now call on the first register, registered delegate, Mr. Robin Brown, if you would like to uh, join us. Your five minutes will start as soon as we hear your voice. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome today. Thank you. Well, here we are again on a day where you will all listen to many public delegations asking you to freeze the police budget. Then we expect you will do what you decided to do a long time ago, approve yet another multi-million dollar police budget increase at your February 27th meeting. And as always, you will justify your decision based on feedback you tell us you've gotten from residents who say they want more police, not less. You won't tell us any of the names of those people who almost never come to these board meetings, but you will ask us to believe you anyway. You and the police say they need more money to hire more officers, especially diverse ones and to pay for training to teach those officers to be culturally competent. You will approve a budget increase because you say we, you, we need more police to protect Ottawa residents from violent crime, even though the OPS's own stats show Ottawa is very safe. You will also approve a budget increase despite the fact that the OPS's own stats show they spend less than 1% of their time responding to priority one calls where there's imminent danger of bodily harm, meaning armed OPS officers spend 99% of their time doing things like directing traffic, babysitting construction sites, and responding to mental health calls. They also spend much of their time over-policing marginalized people, including moving unhoused people away from businesses, and, as their stats show, using force disproportionately on Black, Middle Eastern, and Indigenous people. As the OPS denies that they police the marginalized and protect the powerful, we did some research to see if we could find any evidence that they were, in fact, policing the powerful. First, we Googled Ottawa police charged with fraud, looking for any evidence that the OPS had charged anyone powerful with that favorite crime of the rich, fraud. And the results were really interesting. The third link that came up was about the 613-819 Black Hub getting Hector Addison, a strong ally of the OPS, charged with forgery. And remember, we first submitted our evidence against Addison to the OPS fraud unit who said their hands were tied because the criminal code said they couldn't receive a fraud charge if there was no benefit gained. A completely false claim. The fourth link in our Google results was about the OPS charging three of its own officers involved in last year's tow truck scam. Next, since most uh, of the powerful people in the city are land developers, we Googled Ottawa police charge developer to see if we could find any evidence of the OPS ever charging 
any developers with anything. And the results were even more interesting. The first link that came up was auto police service superintendent arrested on sex charges about former OPS superintendent Mark Patterson, the same guy, by the way, who lied to the hub about the OPS not having its own use of force race data. The second link was Ottawa software developer charged with terrorism. Okay, we thought. They, they, they actually charged a white collar white guy with something. But then when we clicked the story, we saw that the guy the OPS had charged with terrorism was named Mohammed Momin Kawaja. The third link was Crown withdraws corruption charge against Ottawa police officer. And for that one, we thought, ah, there it is again, a white cop getting off easy. Until we learned the cop was named Mohammed Mohammed. One of the tow truck officers involved in the scam was Constable Hussein, As Hussein Assad. And we raised this because the OPS and its supporters, including this board, say that part of the solution to the OPS's problems and why they want more money is to hire more diverse officers. Yet having a diverse workforce didn't stop five black Memphis police officers from beating Tyree Nichols to death last month. The OPS issued a statement condemning those officers supposedly because OPS officers would never be caught on video viciously beating a black man who later died. Well, except for Abdir Ahmad Abdi. More diverse officers don't change policing. Policing changes them. It changes them even if they work with units with nice euphemistic names like Scorpion, the street crime operation to restore peace in our neighborhood, or neighborhood resource teams. It changes them. And we plan to get the data to prove it by asking the Solicitor General to order the OPS to start including the race of officers in their use of force reports. And while we're discussing plans, should you approve at the February 27th meeting your motion to prioritize public delegates who haven't spoken in the last three months, the hub will take the board to court for violating my charter rights. Let me explain. Your proposal to prioritize public delegates who haven't spoken in the last three months might have the best of intentions, although we doubt that, but legally, it's not about your intent, it's about the impact. And the impact will be clear, silencing the one black voice who regularly addresses the board. If you really understood or truly cared about equity or human rights law, you would give special time to black and indigenous delegates, but you don't, so we will act accordingly. It is time, as I always say, to continue reimagining community safety in Ottawa by freezing the OPS budget, pending the outcome of the line-by-line -line audit of all city services, including the OPS. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, members of this committee, would you do you have any questions for Mr. Brown? How about board members in attendance? No, I see none. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for your time. Yeah. We now move to Farnaz Farhang. Farnaz. Welcome to the meeting. Good morning. Good morning. We can hear you loud and clear, Farnaz. Thank you. So your five minutes starts now. Um, I'd like to start off my delegation <clears throat> by asking for the OPSB member on this committee and sitting councillor telling community members that Ottawa Police Force's budget is decreasing to clarify exactly how they've reached that conclusion. Looking at the OPS's percentage portion of the City of Ottawa's budget without considering that the actual budget amount every year is changing isn't enough to reach the conclusion that their budget is decreasing. If the city's budget is growing and yet OPS's percentage is less, it doesn't automatically mean that they have less money. If the percentage is decreasing, but the city of Ottawa's budget amount is increasing, it means there's more to go around. In fact, we're here at another budget meeting where they're asking for another $15.2 million for their operating budget and $60 million for their capital budget. So telling the public that their budget is decreasing is blatant misinformation that OPSB members should be fact checking. Consultations with community members, stakeholders, academics were used as a justification behind this budget. Who was consulted? Was it the hundreds of people who have come to the board over the past few years to ask for a reallocation of funds from police violence to actual community supports? Was it the community members who have lost loved ones because of OPS's violence? The ones who continue to be targeted by OPS's surveillance, harassment, and bullying? The community members who are violently displaced 
and evicted from their homes in a process facilitated by OPS and even some of the current board members. The ones who were promised that this board would be listening and learning in their commitment to <clears throat> dismantle systemic racism. Is that who you were considering when you said that this budget increase wasn't enough and that OPS needed more? Every year we get these budget presentations with a bunch of lists and priorities that the budget will be focusing on. When there's no evidence to support that these real concerns will be fixed by cops, their only tool is to react with enforcement and add to that violence. Violence of brutality, violence of displacing community members, violence of depleting community resources in their efforts to expand this militarized police force. We heard once again the talks of police body cameras brought up in this budget, even though evidence shows that body cams and tech solutions don't fix police violence. We've had many cases where there's footage of their atrocities and they're able to continue with impunity. These tech solutions, like their tasers, are a money grab because once approved, they will come back every year asking for more money to maintain them. They control the frame, the cameras, the narrative, the access to footage, and it's clear that body cams are going to be used as another surveillance mechanism by cops rather than an accountability tool. We hear of the cop per pop justification that just because the population is growing, you need to expand militarized social control in all spaces. Not only is this a really messed up perception that community members are in need of constant surveillance and control, but why not increase access to resources and supports for these expanding communities instead of subjecting them to militarized police in their communities. The paramedics are constantly at level zero, meaning in the case of an actual priority one emergency the people who can actually do something about it might not get there in time. Another listed priority behind this budget includes the advancing advancement of community policing to deal with violence against women. How does a police force who's riddled with toxicity, coercive control, and other vile behavior that includes violence against women and gender-based violence hope to take that on? How do you justify that when over the years, the Ottawa Coalition to End Violence Against Women has spoken up and written to this board to ask that you stop experience of harm and violence to ask for more funding when you're in no position to address it. The community members most at risk of interpersonal violence and domestic violence in their communities are also the same who are most at risk of police violence. Survivors have asked for alternatives to police, and if we want to talk about consultations, the asks in the City of Ottawa's Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan has that as a priority. Throwing more money at the cops to fix, issue, fix issues that they're incapable of fixing and complicit in creating is not grounded on evidence. I urge that at the minimum, you freeze this budget and actually begin reallocating resources to create capacity for alternatives to police. Thank you. Thank you, Farnaz. Member Curry, do you have any questions for Farnaz? No, my hand wasn't up, was it? No, okay. Anyone else? Any other board member? I do have nope. a question. Sorry. All right. Nope, Sorry, go Madam ahead. Chair. I do have nope, a question. Go ahead. Um, can you speak more to the body camera issue? Um, because in many ways, uh, is body camera not sort of a means of accountability of police action? Um, so I'd just be interesting in exploring more of what uh, you have to say with respect to that. Sure. So if we understand that police are coming at different situations with a power imbalance, that's one part of the equation. That, that's where we're starting with. Um, and the fact that they, like the camera is positioned on their bodies. So the perception that we're getting is from their um angle of what when they approach a situation and a lot of the times and this has been the case like they've looked at it in other places that they've implement implemented body cameras um they can say whatever they want behind the camera we don't get to see what the police is doing with the police body camera so we're only looking at it from their body angle of what they're capturing and they can choose to turn it off whenever they want even if there's like rules around it they're, they break rules all the time. So they're, we're only looking at it from their perspective. Even if other uh, members of the community have captured video evidence of their violence, when has that gotten us any form of accountability? When has it prevented that violence from occurring in the first place? So like, 
as a measure measure of like if we have this footage we will be able to hold police accountable it's wrong because it, we already have that footage and we haven't had that accountability but another concern about it is that if you are investing in tech every year there's going to be maintenance uh, costs to that technology so it's it's literally a money grab and okay they might be able to use the cameras to get evidence against other community members but we're still not getting the full story you're only getting the context again from their perception okay thank you i appreciate your perspective all right anyone else nope all right thank you farnes thank you for your delegation thank you uh the next person is bailey Guti. Bailey, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, hi. Okay, great. Um, how are you okay, today? So how are you today? Uh, I'm great. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Thanks. Um, good, thanks. Okay, Go ahead, so I'm going, I'm going to just uh, use my five minutes now. I'm just going to reiterate what I submitted to the board. Um, so basically, uh, I want to talk about the draft budget and the vagueness of the line items. Um, specifically, I would like you to clarify how much and where the line items are pertaining to ongoing paid suspensions. Uh, for example, Mark Patterson, who's been suspended since last September for uh, grooming and sexually assaulting new recruits. Um, so let's see. And I also wanted to ask about Will Hingenberger, who has been on paid suspension for four years for over 20 counts of sexual assault and violence towards women. Just going to read a little article about his, his crimes here. Uh, suspended Ottawa police, uh, Ottawa police staff Sergeant Will Hingenberger is accused of breaching several bail conditions related to his initial charges of sexual assault, forcible confinement, unauthorized possession of a firearm, distributing intimate images without consent, and breach of trust. Uh, distributing an intimate image without consent, that's revenge porn. Um, so he's been on paid suspension for four years now, and he received raises. So I'm looking at the uh, your budget, and I'm looking at the overall page of um, OPS, not the individual departments, which have a lot of really big uh, categories such as other. I'm curious how that kind of wording in a line by line budget is acceptable, because we need to see what every we need to see every single purchase that you've seen that the got any receipts, all these things. I already know you don't keep that stuff, which is crazy, <clears throat> but I'm assuming it's liability claims and professional services. Uh, your liability claims is sitting at almost $2 million and your professional services is sitting at almost $4 million. Um, so I'm really curious how you can justify this line item budget without providing any context to these items. What are you doing? And like in the last five years, what has OPS done for policy reform um, dealing with paid suspensions? Because Ontario is the only province in Canada that is mandated to pay with suspension. And what we see is you have people like Will Hintenberger who are milking their full benefits and pension. That's our taxable money and pension earnings uh, to just resign at the end of their trial. So they milk it and then they resign and then they don't have to charge and they go work at another police service. So I'm really curious what OPS has done in the last five years. And I've been attending this board for four now. So I know it's kind of a trick question. What have you done about the policy changes and the reforms? And where is the paid suspension and litigation and context of the cases for sexual assault and brutalization? Why is your blind by line audit like we need an audit, you need to freeze the budget and audit this completely. And Mark, uh, Mark Sutcliffe said he was looking for that. You need to freeze the budget until that's done. It's gonna cost a lot of money, but it's gonna show your whole ass and that's what we need this to do. And I'm sorry for saying ass. <laughs> Actually, wait, uh, forget your parliamentary language. That's for you guys, not us. Thank you. <laughs> you done, Bailey, yes. I think so. I know you're not going to answer my questions unless you are. Well, actually, I was going to answer your question. Really? Um, I was going to tell. I was going to tell you that this board has advocated to do that change that you have been asking that you mentioned about mm -hmm. uh, suspended police officers. And regrettably, uh, this is a provincial issue. The the legislation states that we have to do this, and so there are means and ways that you as well could advocate for this. Uh, by reaching out to your member of uh, provincial um, pro provincial 
representative, um, which I, I would encourage you to do because that is something that we have tried to change. And well, the new- Can I say something in response? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so um, the thing is before you guys uh, took over the board, uh, Diane Deans and former Chief Slowly had already started implementing a uh, new response system internally at OPS. When El Shantiri got the board, that looked like it got axed. Or you guys just kind of swooped in and just like, oh, we did this. So it's like, in the last five years, I've seen nothing about OPS specifically advocating for this change. I shouldn't be the one that has to do this. That's your job. And you can't keep saying like, well, we need more money. And like 85% of your budget is the salaries, yet you're paying uh, Will Hindenburger like 140K a year plus benefits for sexual assault and like over 20 counts of sexual assault and violence. So it's like, he still works for you. There's an efficiency for you right there. Why is OC Transpo getting uh, $50 million cut from their services and you're getting $60 million for your buildings? You've got some efficiencies there. So it's like, I, I just don't understand how you can just lie through your teeth about the, the realities of these things. Like sexual assault is an unforgivable crime. Yeah, how I totally can you agree. Ever? Yeah, so like, what are you doing about it? Nothing. Well, I just, I just told you that the board has been trying to make that change with the provincial government and we have not what have been, been successful. What, when, when did you- add, There add, has been that? discussions and, and letter writing, uh, what we would normally do to be able to express our views on, on the issue. And what regrettably, they have not accepted that. So well, that's, well, what, that's what the state them. of the nation is at the moment, yeah. So you're all right. that's not your problem? No, we're, I'm not saying we're absolved by that. Uh, I see that Member Curry has her hand up. Member Curry? Thanks for your submission to the board, uh, Bailey. Uh, I was actually just going to ask you on that. Do you know what other provinces have done? Because it would be very helpful. I'm not expecting you to go out and do research, but I'm just wondering right now if you know what other provinces have done. I hear you saying advocate, you know, advocate harder. And, and we can do that. We can continue to do that. Know that that's some, what you're talking about, Bailey, is frustrating to all of us. A lot of professions have that where people are off and they're still getting paid and they've done something that is totally against anything that, you know, they should be doing in that profession and they're still getting paid. So just as frustrating to us, but I just wonder if you know of anything else that was done in another province that uh, you could share with us. Well, the reality of the other provinces is like their provinces, you can suspend without pay. So it's like, that's why I'm curious, like, I've been going to this board for five years, or like four years, basically, and I've never seen any of you talk about this, any of the boards talk about it. The Dean's board did, uh, and slowly did implement a new, uh, like, complaint system for the internal things. So it's like, even then, going into, um, like, the budgets of that, it's like, how many fake psychologists are you still employing, like, Frey, who was used to weaponize, weaponize against uh, console, uh, Kimberly Cataret? What about uh, like, like uh, Kevin Benoist, stuff like that? He's still employed. Where's the justice for Kate Mitchell? You know what I mean? Like there's been, and like just looking like publication bans and all these things, that has to come from you. That has to come from the OPS and you need to stop hiring these goobers all the time. And like the Mark Patterson, he's been working how long at OPS? How many more victims did he have? that weren't caught. And like, that's the thing you can't, you know who the problem officers are and that you're silent. Like these, like this has to come from OPS. You know who the problem officers are and you do nothing. Even if it's like locked up in like the PSA or like the provincial stuff and all these things, that's up to you, okay? You can push him out, you can charge him. You can, there's so many workarounds and you guys have the control of the, uh, the criminal justice system because it's linked to the courts. Like, I'm not saying it's all OPS, but it's like, I understand that it goes through the courts and those are also like messed up and they protect predators and stuff like this. But as a municipal police force here, what have you done? You so know Bailey, who's... Bailey, yes. I will ask the chief to speak. He's got his hand up. Cool, thank you. Thanks for asking questions this time. <laughs> That's kind of what... Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Bailey, I just wanted to let you know, um, the association or the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, their general meeting in uh, July of 2021, they passed a motion that um, spoke to exactly what you're referencing um, and, and then released a, a media uh, a statement. And I'll just read the headline of it. It says, police leaders call for substantive changes to Ontario's police discipline system, which includes um, suspension without pay. So we are part of that association and we did support and will continue to support that uh, particular motion. Um, but it is a legislative change. 
that is needed. There is a new um, you know, Police Service Act um, that is going to be um, unveiled in the coming months. Um, and whether it includes this particular um, um, aspect of change, uh, we don't know because we haven't seen that legislation yet, but it is something that uh, police leaders in Ontario, including the OPS, have supported. Okay. Thank you, Madam no, Chair. All right. Thank you, Chef. All right, Bailey. So thank you for your delegation today. And we will now move on to the next one. Thank you. Raise the budget and audit it. Mr. Adi Olumid, if you would like to uh, take the floor, please, for five minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go okay. ahead. Your five minutes starts now. Thank you. <laughs> Quick comment. I hope this doesn't count to my five minutes. Um, the board can pass uh, a rule given um, no investigations beyond 120 days without board approval. And uh, for disciplinary hearings, they can give that, you know, I mean, preferably three months, but even if it's six months. But basically, the board can pass a rule to ensure that. Um, from, from when it's accused and to when there's a disciplinary, it doesn't take more than a year. So then we don't have all these four years correcting the salary. So that's in the board's power. So that was in reference to the previous conversation. And <laughs> now my comments, hope I don't run out of time. But it's okay to hit my black guts. Um, but it's not okay to violate section 123 of the criminal code. Influences or attempts to influence a municipal official to abstain from voting, to vote against, or to fail to perform an official act by suppression of the truth in the case where a person who is under duty to disclose the truth. Justice Horrigan lashed out against malfeasance, the wrongful uh, withholding of information retroactively and dishonestly, intentionally misleading counsel. City management replied with a promise of transparency. So where is the transparent reply to re OPS business plan, objectives, core functions, how we provide uh, police services, resource planning, impact on the budget for other city committees? Then I said, there's no penalty. Um, there's no penalty. Oh my goodness. A final budget can be set aside for violating the regulation that requires a business plan every three years. There's no penalty. Therefore, if council approves the OPS budget, that's an abusive process because it allows the OPSB and council to do indirectly what they cannot do directly. Please explain why you disagree. So this is a question that's gone both to the city website consultation and the OPS website. So I hope I will get a public and transparent response to that question. Councillors told me, and I agree, that non-lawyers have to do what the city lawyer says. The Auditor General confirmed my allegations that city lawyers can have a conflict of interest. The OPS budget should fund needs of the necks of Indigenous people, visible minorities, and female police officers by immediately funding an OPSB legal counsel. City lawyers issued a legal opinion with four false statements which were weaponized by councillors to publicly defame and malign the black, so as to profit off lower credibility black slave trade pre-existing disadvantages. I issued 11 extricable questions of law and I respectfully asked the board to take the chains of the indigenous and black community by referring both documents to the police commission. And FYI, Canada did enslave indigenous and black people. Now, a female counselor said to me, if this was me, I would not want police investigating the police. May I politely remind female members of the board that if these declarations are not referred to the commission, there will be disproportionate harm to female police officers across Ontario. The chief himself said, Inspector Two does not have enough resources. So this budget should fund the OPSB and the Chief's Gender Equity Lens promise to retask internal investigations to an independent Office of Workplace Investigations. 
which can be a law firm or the Auditor General. The only sacred cow is criminal investigations. Once every three years, Ontario gave counsel the right to negotiate an OPSB business plan on whether to retask, similar to the Toronto City Council $11 million pilot, which is run by a black female uh, social worker, whether to retask the 911 call center, whether to retask speeding by laws, uh, speed traps on city streets, whether to retask all police misconduct investigations so as to get value from the 35% compensation differential between sworn officers and other city staff. Lastly, if the OPS pass a budget without a business plan, the commission can void the budget. Will the board refer the 11 declarations to the commission so we can find out the truth? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ade Olimid. Uh, any questions from board members? By the way, we are refreshing our um, strategic plan this in the coming months, Ade. So thank you for your uh, comments. Can I respond to that? Yes. The regulation, a, a strategic plan is not a business plan. The regulation specifically requires a business plan every three years Mm -hmm. and gives council power to jointly develop that business plan with the OPSB. So that's what I'm referring to when I say yes. that city solicitor are misleading council that they do not, they cannot once every three years have direct input to negotiate the budget with the OPSB. So what I'm saying is this, because that law has been broken, because there is no business plan and the business plan is required in order to draft the budget, in a judicial review, that is grounds to strike down the budget. So I'm saying this is my position and I've explained it. So will the board and the city respond to why they disagree with this position? That's question one. Question two is that I, I nicely laid out 11 declarations on questions of law where me and the city solicitor are in disagreement. So won't the board want to find out who is correct by sending this to the commission. Thank you, um, Monsieur Limid, for your, your comments. And I will review um, this with the uh, uh, Auditor General and the City Solicitor and uh, provide you with an answer. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Moksha Singh Sharp. Moksha, the next five minutes are yours. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear and see me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you for having me. You, you may start your delegation. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Y'all are so intimidating. Okay. Hello. <laughs> and happy Black History Month. Um, yes. Miss being in the boardroom in person and seeing all your welcoming faces and armed officers everywhere. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, I'm not going to try and sit here and express my frustration to a boardroom of people who, by their lack of action, do not appear to be taking our concerns about policing seriously. But what I will say is that people in Ottawa are worried about crime and safety in the city. And so we can see that you're going to try and help by increasing the police budget again. And um, the we know that the stats on your website show that there's no, um, that when you increase the police budgets, the crime, there's no crime reduction. And so, um, even in some areas of the city, your data shows us that um, crime even increased, even though the police got more money and more resources. Um, and I personally would like to live in a safer city. And we are shown that another multi-million dollar increase for the OPS is not going to get us there. Um, so um, let's imagine a better city where we gave um, those amounts of money toward mental health supports and housing and domestic violence services or our 
failing public transportation, um, we will never get there to that city if we refuse to make small steps like freezing an already plentiful police budget. Um, so I'm not gonna yell defund and abolish the police. Um, I'm just pointing out like many are pointing out today that we need to, um, we need to di redirect that money to services that, that will help us. Um, the board and council have the power to approve or to not approve the LPS budget. And if you really want to keep all Ottawa residents safe, you will reject further LPS budget increases and demand for a budget that freezes up that budget and opens up funding for other things that actually keep us safe. Um, that is the Ottawa that I want to grow up in and that me and my friends will feel safe in. So I don't really care if I show up here at every meeting and every meeting you either bring up some sort of rule that says I'm not allowed to speak or if you smile and thank me for my presentation, knowing that you will ignore every single word that comes out of my mouth. Um, but I will come back and the community will come back and we will show up and we won't stop until we see that our communities are listened to. Thank you very much for your time. I was saying thank you, Mokshan. Please do not think that we're ignoring you. Every board member is listening to every word that is being said here today. Are there any questions from board members? Not at this time? All right. Thank you, Moksha, for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Meryl Aduli. Hello, Meryl. Hello? Yes, hello. How are you? Hey, good morning. I'm good. How are you? Good. All right. Very good. Thanks. So you have uh, five minutes for your delegation. Please proceed. Okay. On January 27th of this year, the Ottawa police released a statement condemning the murder of Tyree Nichols at the hand of police officers in Tennessee. The statement appropriately identified Mr. Nichols' death as inexcusable and deeply troubling. I and many others in our community found this statement to be an act of mere moral posturing, considering the Ottawa police has yet to take any accountability for the deaths of Anthony Aus and Abdurrahman Abdi. 23-year-old Anthony Aus suffered from anxiety and during an unnecessarily forceful no-knock raid conducted over suspicion of possession of drugs and a gun that wasn't found in his apartment, Aus died by falling out, out of his 12th story bedroom window, while the rest of his family, who were also in the apartment during the unnecessarily forceful no-knock raid, now live with extreme emotional distress. 37-year-old Abdurrahman Abdi, an individual who has also suffered with mental illness, was murdered by Ottawa police's Daniel Monsion, who beat Abdurrahman Abdi to death while re wearing reinforced gloves. The Ottawa police then lifted Monsion's suspension. These cases of extreme force being used are not isolated incidents of poor judgment by police officers. As a resident of the city, I hear countless stories of individuals making 911 calls for help in mental health situations and then being subjugated to unnecessary use of force by police. These stories being disproportionately higher um, among those in um, marginalized groups, especially among those who identify as being part of Black, Middle Eastern, Indigenous and Two-Spirit LGBTQ plus communities. This resent is also reflected in the Ottawa Police's 2021 annual report that included results of a survey the Ottawa Police conducted, which showed an increase of dissatisfaction in police services among marginalized groups, which makes the recent statement about Tyree Nichols's murder all the more insincere and quite plainly put hypocritical. I will speak for myself, but I'm positive that I reflect the sentiment of others within the city. I do not feel safe around police. I fear the police. During the unlawful occupation by the convoy last year and whenever else they decided to pop up afterwards, me, my friends and members of within my community made jokes, but we were being serious about how if we were to go downtown, we'd not only experience harassment by neo-fascists, but also experience trouble with the police. But police officers cannot solely be held um, to blame for the mistrust. It's also at the hands of the board. 
Um, police officers have three jobs. The first is their actual job, which is to protect and serve. And the other two are that of a social worker and that of a mental health professional, which they have no business doing, considering they, they don't have the training for it. Officers have also taken on the role of being judge, jury, and executioner, but I haven't got the time to delve into that. Detasking police officers with services they have no training in will reduce the likelihood of police interactions with vulnerable community members. Reducing violence perpetrated by police, which will naturally regain the public's trust. Now, I'm certain members of the board have heard these statements time and time again, which has led to a general feeling of frustration towards the Ottawa police by residents of the city, who, myself, can't help but wonder why it is taking so long to dismantle a dated power structure that works against both police officers and residents of the city. Even if members of this board did not care at all about the public and only held loyalties to the police, they would work towards diminishing the divide between the public and, and police by restructuring the system from being an oppressive authority that we are meant to fear and making it into something that, it, that, um, that works for the community, making it um, a service that is members of our community who chose to protect us from acts of an, immor an immoral and unethical nature. After looking at the city and police budgets, I quickly understood that the reason why these services are, are still exist are because they're still being funded. The Ottawa Police Services Board thoughtless request for more funding shows a complete disregard to what the residents of this city actually want. And members of this board who toss around the irrelevant claim that funding is decreasing prove that they do not only they do not actually care about meeting the needs of the community. It costs a specific amount of money to provide uh, services. You don't need a specific percentage that is um, available within the city's budget. The police budget is far from being underfunded and is actually bloated. Using the convoy as an excuse isn't fooling anyone. The reason why the situation got as bad as it did isn't because you're underfunded, it was because you blew it. The Ottawa Police Services Board should be supportive of funds being shared with other services as it benefits not only the public but even the police. I implore members of this board to read the alternative budget by the Ottawa Coalition for a People's Budget and to work with organizations such as CAMS Ottawa and the Ottawa CPEP Group to work towards adopting services that work for all and not for the few by creating legitimate change that can we can be proud of and that the and so that when next time the Ottawa Police condemns police brutality, we can proudly stand beside that behind that statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meryl. Thank you for your thoughts. I see no questions, so we'll move to the next delegation. Aaron O'Neill. Aaron, are you with us? Hello, Aaron. Ah, there, I see your name now, Aaron. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and okay. clear. Okay. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, um, I, I, everybody has said a lot of things already. Um, and I don't necessarily need to go over what I was going to say, because like I said, everyone has said a lot of really good things. Um, and one of the things that, you know, kind of gets talked about over and over and over again, um, is the fact that we spend so much money doing very silly things with the police. And one of those silly things um, is handing out popsicles. We have a popsicle patrol that goes around in the summertime to marginalized neighborhoods and hands out popsicles. And this is something that a neighborhood resource team will do. Why? Why, why are we paying police officers to hand out popsicles? What is that, what is that exactly doing? And why are we paying them the, the amount of money that they make per hour, if we were to delve into it per hour, to do that? Can, is it doing anything for those kids? Not really. They put them in their car, they woohoo the lights because that's fun, you know, kids like the lights, but it doesn't really do anything at the end of the day. And it costs so much money to do that. If it's about giving them popsicles just because it's hot and we want to give them popsicles, 
give families a gift card to the grocery store. That's way less expensive. And if it's to give them something fun to do, pay city staff like lifeguards and uh, day camp workers, that is also much less expensive to do. Keep libraries open longer, much less expensive to do, and doesn't involve police. When it comes to mental health calls, you talk about response times. Police are at my apartment dealing with me, sometimes for like a half an hour, an hour, and you've got two, sometimes three cops show up because usually it's two, two show up. And then sometimes a third one is like, oh, what are my buddies doing? They see the cop, the cars outside and they're like, oh, what's going on? And they show up. So you got three cops and they're all chit-chatting with me. And they're just, we're just all talking about what resources do not exist in both the city and the province we've had this conversation a million times and they keep showing up because my superintendent keeps calling. Why doesn't he get maybe, I don't know, charged with misuse of police resources or at least threatened with that so that he stops calling because there's no reason for him to continue calling, to continue wasting their time I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm having a mental health crisis. And their time is being wasted coming to my apartment, talking to me, having the same conversation, and then leaving. And they're here for sometimes a very long time because we're just talking. We're just having the same conversation. And it is, it's just, it's, it's silly. That's the only word that I can really use to fit into your parliamentary language is silly. And I and so when I and when I talk to the officers that are here, they agree with me that it, it's a waste of their time. They often will say, well, we're just trying to de-escalate you. And I'm like, but you're not even trained to do that. And they're like, oh yeah, we're we're not. And so they just they're just like, okay, I guess we'll leave then. And I'm like, yeah, I guess that's probably a good idea. And maybe on your way out, tell him not to call. Like just tell him, don't do it. I will calm down on my own and he knows that and you know that and let's just stop all of this silliness and if you want me to get better and to have better access to things that actually help me pay for it i'm on waiting lists they don't have money to help me so pay for that stuff instead but you don't you continue to say that you need to pay for this that and the other thing in the police budget and you don't need to do that you need to pay for things that actually help. And there's copious amounts of data, copious amounts of data that show you that reducing things like poverty reduce crime. And I don't understand why you sit there and you look at me and all the other delegates that continue to come here and you don't put those two things together. Reducing poverty reduces crime. It's just so simple. And there's data, data, scholarly data, academic data. It's all over the place. Reduce poverty reduces crime. From childhood poverty that affects the development of the child's brain, it's all over the place. And then you get mad at people who show up and frustrated I see people rolling their eyes and giggling and stuff like that. I see it all the time. I pay attention to those patterns. I watch how frustrated you get at people when they talk because you don't like to hear that we're right. So and you, don't, you, 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 you don't like to hear it. That's the thing. You don't no. like to hear it. That's and not, that's, that's, that's not the situation right now. The situation is, it, are, is you, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure I've listened to every single word that you've said. You listened, but you don't like to hear it. That's the diff. That's what I'm saying is you don't it's, like to hear. You don't like to a, hear. You don't like to hear what I'm saying. That's the thing. You don't like to hear it. You don't like to hear well, it. All right. So it's not that I don't like to hear it. Mm, I don't okay, agree let's, with let's, that. Let's, let's, let's get that first point straight. But you've said your piece and it's somebody else's turn now. Sure. But you don't, you don't like to hear that I, that we're right. Because you don't I've make already, I've already said to you that that's not true. But if well, then, that's what you, if that's then what start, you want to believe, then, then start changing things now and freeze the budget. 
Well, you know what? We're trying as, as no, hard trying, as we can. Yes, trying, yes we trying. are. No, you're, well, we're try doing, harder. Yeah. Okay, Aaron. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sam Hirsch, it is, it is now your opportunity to speak, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so just to respond briefly to the, uh, or comment briefly on the previous delegate uh, and finishing up and just say, you know, I think we know why the police paid, uh, you know, folks to handle popsicles, obviously to make the service look good. And I'm not sure if there's a department that spends more on marketing and PR than the than the OPS. And, you know, there's probably a very big efficiency there, bigger than $500,000 that we could probably find there. So thanks, uh, thanks to the, the previous delegate for bringing that up. And it's too bad to see that, uh, you know, she was uh, cut short there. But, uh, you know, I just obviously want to uh, recognize that, uh, you know, we're on the uh, unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin people because, you know, it's an important thing to remember and and a pretty hollow land acknowledgement from the auto police board. So I wanted to do it in the beginning of my delegation because, you know, when you have someone sitting in the uh, chief's chair who was deeply involved in perpetuating armed violence against Indigenous peoples on what's what's who in territory, uh, you know, I think it's important. And having someone complicit in colonial violence isn't a good look for uh, reconciliation. And, uh, you know, I, I want to begin uh, by, you know, reading out the board policy in regard to scope and accountability. Uh, it reads, you know, the board represents the public interest in determining appropriate organizational performance of the auto police services and in providing civilian oversight and government of the activities of the police service. You know, as stated in the board policy, the role of members of this board is to represent the public interest, not to represent the interest of the police. You're our representatives to the police. I know, I, you know, I've said this often, but it, do it doesn't seem to... Uh, bode well or, or 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 go into folks's head but it's you know not vice versa you know then why are members on this committee that are deliberately misleading the public and actually telling them that the police budget is decreasing we know this isn't true it literally says that the budget is increasing on our city's website it, it isn't okay to spread misinformation and use cherry pick tactics <laughs> to support a police narrative this board is supposed to be an oversight board for the police and not a pr and marketing board for them the myth being spread, and it's already been mentioned here several times, is that the police budget is decreasing because the proportion has decreased from 2017 or whatever random metric, random year that they're using. Uh, but the share of the budget is a reflection of the size of the total budget and cannot be used to state that the police budget is increasing or decreasing. I would highly caution members against using this rhetoric. It's misleading, untrue, and will lead to further mistrust that you know even the police and you have all uh, um, acknowledged that exists among vast uh, uh, sections of, of, of our population here in Ottawa. I mean, and further, let, let's look at the capital budget. It's nearly tripling in size from $23 million to $60 million. Instead of choosing to delay the building of the South facility, this mayor and council are going to choose to delay LRT stage two, which will cost residents a lot more. LRT uh, would, stage two would benefit people a lot more than a, a police station in Barhaven. You know, it, it truly astounds me that members can sit here and tell me and their constituents that this police budget is actually decreasing when in fact it's increasing more than it ever has before. It's increased by uh, over 300% since amalgamation. Now, I could pick a random uh, a stat too and say, uh, uh, right before amalgamation, the police budget skyrocketed the next year. Of course it skyrocketed because the city amalgamated, but I'm not gonna do that because I like to talk about facts. You know, the increase in the police budget is, is, is you know, right now there's a housing and planning committee uh, meeting happening uh, and at the same time and they're uh, and they're talking about whether or not to allocate just 15 million dollars to build more affordable homes two hundred thousand dollars less than the police budget increase think about that you know and, and just a second about the uh, community consultations that police do you know they're they're not legitimate in my view they're hand-picked consultations and focus groups that don't actually reflect what people want what we've heard from this chief and from members of this board is that you don't think the police budget should be uh should be decreased. Uh, you know, if you don't think that the police budget should be increased, well, they just say, well, we disagree. That's not dialogue. That's not community consultation. Will you listen to the majority of survey respondents uh, if, if they say that you need to cut and find efficiencies of the police budget? Probably not. You know, the police themselves even, even admit in their budget that the efficiencies this year are less than in previous years. Uh, and, you know, that they weren't even able to meet the efficiency target last year. Why is there a consistent double standard when it comes to efficiencies in the police? 
Uh, you know, uh, uh, the last time you know, just to finish, you know, the last time we spoke at the police board meeting, Mayor Sutcliffe said that he and the board, when advocating for an increase of the budget, were speaking for the people who aren't here today. Well, uh, you know, there are tons and tons of people who support a freeze who are also not here today speaking. I've spoken to them, homeless folks, residents traumatized by the convoy, people living out in the suburbs too. Just because they aren't here in an extremely inconvenient time doesn't mean that there aren't tons more who oppose this arbitrary increase today when other services like paramedic services are getting crumbs while we continue to see multiple level zeros. And finally, just to wrap up in response to the question slash comment around body cams, it has been proven to not be effective around stopping police killings. And the mur police murder of Tyre Nichols is a fact, a case in fact. It didn't stop his killing. It didn't stop George Floyd's death. And the fact that there has been video footage of Abdurrahman Abdi's death didn't bring Daniel Monson into justice. So of course, the Auto Police Association is excited about this because they know it's a hollow move towards false accountability that they can point to for brownie points without doing the actual work of holding police officers accountable. Thank you. Suzanne, you're on mute. I cannot hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Are there any questions for Sam? I see none. Okay, thank you very much, Sam. Bye for now. All right, so this concludes the public delegations. In keeping with the board's past practice around budget deliberations, I'll now call upon registered council delegations who wish to make comments. We will still maintain the five minute time limit. However, I will permit questions to be asked of staff. So Councillor Brockington, over to you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Good morning to you and Chief. Good morning. All members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, join you today and offer a few comments of my own. I'm not going to uh, focus on the budget line by line at this time. I've attended many of your meetings in the past, but I do want to um, raise a chronic concern in my ward that I've raised at the board that needs a little more attention and I hope to uh, raise that with you today. Um, I believe that the OPS's priorities need to be a reflection of community's priorities and the priorities of our residents. And one top priority in River Ward that has consistent since even before I was elected door knocking is that of road safety and speed enforcement. And um, my concerns is there appears to be a, a chasm between the expected uh, service levels and needs within our, our communities and the service that we're seeing delivered in residential communities in particular. And, um, you know, the police sometimes post pictures of their, their work on Lime Bank Road. It seems to be a number one street that the police like to promote, very rural and open. Um, Heron Road in my ward in particular coming down a hill. Uh, I don't dispute that there's speeding or, or issues, but my number one concern and priority is, is our residential communities where we hear from over and over and over and where the risks to the public are higher and higher and higher. And I'm saying sometimes the low hanging fruit seems to get the police's attention. And really it's not a reflection of where our community continues to raise concerns. I, I want to talk about the, the need and expectation that the police sit down with elected members at least once a year to talk about priorities. We don't seem to be doing that on any consistent basis, and there needs to be an understanding of, of what those priorities are. I certainly you know, represent 50,000 people, can summarize what those issues are, and it's more than just road safety and, and enforcement issues. Um, the introduction of the neighborhood response teams was a welcomed addition. We obviously fell short on sort of community policing and there were some budget reductions there. And I think there was wide agreement that that was not a good direction to go in. And so the, the introduction of the NRTs was, was welcomed into the community. And uh, these teams of seven or eight have even a, a traffic resource again, which is really great. Um, but since their introduction, community has clearly stated to me, and it was again reinforced during the past election campaign, that there's really a disconnect uh, in the community about the NRTs, who they are, what do they do, what are their priorities, how are their priorities set, how do they engage the community to determine what those priorities and needs are. And I did raise that with senior staff last year. What I would like to see with NRTs is an annual discussion about what the objective should be input to those objectives. And at the end of the year, there should be 
input to an assessment, a measurement tool. How do you know your NRTs are being successful? Are the NRTs meeting the goals that were originally uh, established? You continue to increase NRTs across the city, which I do believe is a good move, but the community saying, well, wait a minute, uh, we have significant needs. We've been identified as neighborhoods that need more police service, and yet there isn't that engagement on what should our priorities be and reporting out. I do know they do good work, but the average uh, resident has no clue, no idea. So it's frustrating that road safety issues and road enforcement matters continue to be top of mind. I can list why um, these degrade from vibrant, healthy, successful communities when we allow traffic issues to get out at hand. And there's that disconnect. So don't just go for low hanging fruit on the lime banks and hair and roads uh, of the city of Ottawa and look at chronic complaints that are submitted within residential communities that take away residents' enjoyment of getting out there and enjoying going for a jog, biking, walking with your grandchildren because there are chronic speeders, people running stop signs in residential communities, school zones where we don't see enforcement that we need to have. And that, my understanding is because there are other priorities the chief or senior management have that discretion to reallocate those resources to tackle other issues, and they understand that. But you know, when Chief Bordalo uh, made traffic enforcement and road safety one of his top three priorities, and then we didn't see the funding, uh, and then we had no uh, community police officers for a period of time, community said, "Hey, what's going on here?" Mm -hmm. So the NRTs are good. Uh, but like I said, I want to reinforce the need for greater communication with counselors, greater communication with the public, and a greater co-establishment of those priorities and an understanding at the end of the year whether they've been effective. So lots to say. I wanted to plant that today because that continues to be a major issue in my ward. And we need to see, it may not be a budget issue, it's more about prioritization of your resources and a better uh, communication uh, with members of council and other community leaders. So I'll park it there for now, Madam Chair. That's uh, excellent comments, uh, Councillor Brockington. Thank you very much. And that will be excellent for us to uh, talk in our strategic planning. So definitely we will, uh, we will bring those, those uh, comments of yours up during that, those discussions. I see that uh, Member Curry has her hand up. Yeah, first of all, I just want to say thanks a lot, Councillor Brockington, for coming to say that. There, are, You're actually, you may think you're only speaking for 50,000 people, but it actually is the same thing I'm hearing from most uh, councillors in the rural and suburban wards saying the same thing, that the NRTs, you know, similar to when we have the LRT breaks down, we have R1 busing, the buses come from other areas. That's, that's what's happening with our NRTs, is my understanding is that we often pull uh, officers that are from outlying areas into to some of the you know protests or whatever it is we have going on. But what I want to ask you is what do you like how do you see that happening? I, I know it's not difficult for you to meet with the NRT or the you know for the police to have to come and talk to us about our award stats. That, that's I think an easy one. How do you see that meeting? You just think you want to have like a community meeting with the NRT? Or because I mean you've got different areas of town and your geography is big. You know, some areas are enormous. How do you see that actually happening? Because this is totally what we'll be talking about. One of the things we'll be talking about in strategic planning for sure. Yeah, I, after the election, I did reach out to the um, Carlington NRT uh, sergeant and we did have a, a town hall. I said within the first, I think, 30 days of taking office, I would host that. And that was great. And I think that was a good first step. Um, I have two NRTs. I couldn't name you one officer on the Southern NRT. And that's a failure on my part, because I should know the service providers in my ward. And I've just been so engaged in the northern section, which has greater coverage and I think more issues to know that team. Um, but it's not just road, road safety ash, um, uh, issues, Councillor Curry. It's, um, you know, property standard issues and, and crime and, you know, drug dealing and uh, car break-ins. And um, I see my role as, as a major facilitator between um, the police and community 
and I'm at the police of service and many times that they want me to organize a meeting of community leaders to boil down what the issues are. And then we look to the NRT or, or our community police officers and say, all right, here are the three main issues, guys. What's your plan? Get back to us in 30 days. How are you going to respond to this? What's the best way to respond to this? Um, so I can share that with the community and, and you go from a very, uh, you know, minor way to deal with problems to a, a you know very high level of resources depending on what the issue or issues are but um that seems to have been lost we, we just don't have that constant line of communication and you know the answer sometimes i get is well you can contact us anytime and i i agree i, I acknowledge that but there it's one thing for me just to send an email it's another where the police engage with me and my residents or community leaders we identify issues and we hear back on what the plan is to address those. And um, I do know the police are, are making inroads and there are successes and there's good work happening, but we don't know that. that that's just not shared with us. And I think that would help the police in the community uh, better explain what they're up to and what they're doing. Because I do know there is good work happening, but the general public have no idea. And I think there's got to be a way for the public to, to hear that as well. Super. On that, the chief has a comment, I think. Thanks. Yes, I was going, going to say that uh, very good comments again. And I see that the chief's hand is up and I would really like to hear from him on, on what we've been talking here. Chief. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Councillor Brockton and Curry uh, for the comments. A lot of issues there um, to uh, to discuss. So I, I just want to maybe go through briefly a few of them um, just to make a quick comment. And I see Deputy Chief uh, Burnett has, has his hand up as well, too. And um, he looks after a number of those units as well, too. So I hope I don't uh, step on your toes there too much, uh, Paul, in what I'm going to say. I mean, in regards to the, the traffic issues and road safety, um, I cannot argue with you one bit, agree with you in terms of that that need to have more presence and have more uh, enforcement in key areas. Um, we, it is a, a unit that is, um, the vacancy rate on that unit, uh, I really want to <laughs> decrease it uh, and get, get more resources into that unit. Um, I think they're, they're around half of what they should be. So the, and the unfortunate part is that, you know, we, we usually take uh, people from the front line on, into traffic and there, there are those that want to go but the front line is short, so they, they get blocked, if you will, from going in. And we um, we do want to see more people get into that area. And uh, traffic is also a candidate to uh, to get pulled from their substantive duties to help with level five visits, escorting um, uh, heads of state around or helping out with some of our protests. So given that situation, I, I agree with you, uh, Councillor, that we need to be very uh, strategic with the, the resources that we do have and what they are uh, and what they are doing, and, and in your words, the low-hanging fruit on a, a rural flat straight road, if that is in fact the case, I don't know that, but if I say, I'll agree with you that that's occurring. Um, is that the best use of, uh, of those uh, members that we have versus, um, you know, some distracted driving or um, impaired driving or speeding in school zones, et cetera? So I think we do need to be more um, uh, strategic there, and I will be looking into, you know, those schedule, if you will, of projects and efforts that we're going to make uh, and uh, and I'll, then I'll pass that portion off, off to Paul. In regards to um, the the neighborhood resource teams, uh, look, I, I'm a big proponent of them. I think they're it's a it's a great initiative and it is a great uh, program. And you know we're in you know um, year three or four of well, depending on which where the teams are, I guess uh, some are earlier than others. And I think like any program, when you roll it out, um, you roll it out and you see you have to assess. And, and then tweak, change, or cancel, or whatever the, the, pro, uh, the result might be. And there certainly is value there, but I, I do agree that we do need to tweak, we do need to change how uh, some of how we do business there. And I know uh, Paul, uh, along with uh, Superintendent uh, Bryden, who runs the uh, NRTs, um, we'll be looking at, and it'll be part of our strategic planning with the board as well too, is how do we define what the priorities are in Vanier versus Central Town versus Canada and et cetera. And that obviously is gonna change and make sure that we, we come to down. We use the, the counselors as those facilitators and that, that guide, the guiding in the ward of um, are we talking to the right people based on who we know, based on who you know, do, did we nail that in terms of what we think we know? And, um, and then apply those priorities to their work. And then of course have those measures of what we did or didn't do 
And if we didn't do, why is that? Or, or what, what, what was the problem there? So I think that that is something um, that is coming. But, um, and just la and then quickly, in regards to the overall consultation, I think you said it, Councillor Brogdon, in terms of being a facilitator, certainly I agree with that. And I know you did organize or, or um, were, were um, a big proponent of that town hall meeting that did occur. Um, and love to see that in the other wards as well too. Um, and even if the councillor isn't there, just guiding us to specific areas that you need to talk to this group of people or that area uh, is also uh, very helpful, um, you know, just to, to make sure that we, we get it right when we're talking to those people. I'll maybe stop there and um, Paul, if you have anything else to add to what I, uh, what I just said. Uh, no, Chief, I think you uh, actually nailed it there. I know uh, I've had some conversations with, with the councillor himself and I know he is a uh, big uh, data person. And uh, Councillor, you'll be uh, very happy to know that we have uh, really sort of delved into that in, in terms of our review of our uh, NRT and our uh, neighborhood policing strategy. And uh, we have in, in, in fact um, uh, included or hired a research firm that will help us uh, be conducting evaluation work in early 2023. Um, and and uh, really uh, conducting an evaluate, evaluability assessment and developing a logic model, um, you know, that, that sort of uh, will lay the foundation for any outcome evaluation that uh, we can expect. And, and essentially what that will do will help us in exactly what you're talking, where we're looking at uh, working with neighborhoods, developing a strategy, what do they want to see of their NRTs, uh, building that out, um, meeting those uh, mandates and, and being able to measure that, uh, whether it, that's at a six month or a one year period and reporting back to those communities and to the, to the board around the successes. Are we doing exactly what that community wants us to do? So um, I would say look forward to that. And uh, in terms of your, your uh, point around um, uh, CPOs, meeting with you, um, you know, that's something that we can certainly work with and make sure that those are regular um, contacts that are made with you. I know that they do uh, often reach out to uh, the various counselors. Um, I took the liberty of, of, of um, at the beginning of 2022, making sure that that was one of the things that I wanted to see of our CPOs and our NRTs. And uh, uh, happy to share with you those numbers if you'd like. Uh, I understand that you you would like face-to-face uh, -face, uh, types of uh, interactions that might not be necessary um, all the time. And yes, we are drawing some of our resources to deal with some of the issues that we, we see down uh, here at uh, Parliament. So um, not ideal situation, but I, I have full confidence as we, as we start to hire more, uh, we'll be able to find some consistency of NRTs in their neighborhoods. Great, thank you uh, for that information. I appreciate it, thank you. I would just like to add that uh, the word communication came up quite a bit and perhaps there's a way that uh, we can develop a communication strategy to ensure that we are reaching out and we, we have these touch points where, you know, not just once every 12 months kind of thing, that there's something that it reoccurs uh, maybe three, four times a year to make sure that uh, we are delivering and we are keeping the dialogue going with, with the communities and the different ward councillors. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Brockington. Um, this concludes our council delegations. Uh, I will now go to questions from committee members followed by the board members. So I don't see any hands up just at the moment. I have a few questions myself, but I was going to uh, give the floor to uh, my colleagues here before I started. All right, Councillor Curry. I was gonna say, you go ahead and share first and then I'll go after you. Okay, all right. Um, I was going to say that overall, I believe that this budget and its rationale certainly um, are taking us into the right direction, Chief. Um, I think with uh, the new health safety measures, both for our community and our members is clearly indicated as well as investments in technology and your greening initiatives. So I commend you on that. So uh, my questions are the following. 
uh, in light of some of the Auditor General's recommendations, I can see some new budget needs arising for the board this year that weren't necessarily accounted for in the budget estimates. I'd like to know what sort of flexibility we have if the board needs to increase funding in one or more of its accounts. For example, we're running a recruitment process for two deputies this year, and over 60% of our professional services budget will be spent on this expense alone. So what options do we have if we need increased funding to fulfill our board's mandate? So uh, thanks, so Chief, I, I can be happy to answer that if you wish. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so what I can tell you is once we approve the budget for the year, uh, the, the allocations to the areas will be, will be set. Um, we have another budgeting process coming up in the very near future. So we can always look to address the amount of funding that would be allocated from a base perspective to the board at, in, in next year's budget. That being said, there's always flexibility and we're absolutely 100% here to support the board. So if we have in-year pressures, if there's in-year needs, we'll find funding solutions to be able to manage, manage those through the year and look at building that up for a case to look at what sort of uh, increased funding we would need year over year from a base perspective. So as the needs arise, make us aware, financially we'll work to, uh, to manage them and make sure you have the support you need from the service. Okay, because definitely this year we're going to undertake, uh, from a human resources standpoint, we're going to be working with the HR committee in looking at what the needs of our boards are to fulfill the recommendations. And these are promises that we have made to the AG for this year. So definitely we can uh, have a discussion further, perhaps at our next HR committee with you on this subject matter. I see your hand up now, Member Curry. Would you like to ask your question? Sure. Yeah, I have a, a number of questions. So if you feel like you want to go to somebody else eventually, but I have quite a few. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks very much to the chief and thanks for uh, uh, CAO Bell to come and meet with all the different uh, councillors and help them understand the budget as well. The, to our original point, communication is key. And that was very, very helpful. And thanks for coming with our ward stats as well and, um, and talking specifically about what's going on in our various wards. Um, I also want to say thanks because it relates to one of the questions that I have um, for how well the recent protests went and even just yesterday, um, getting everyone through the city. Um, I know that takes resources, hence that's going to come to one of my questions, but thank you very much for, for how smoothly that went. People were very pleased with that. I heard that from a number of people. Um, I'm also very pleased about how much consultation is going uh, on. I know people, some people believe that, you know, we're not getting all that we can, but we certainly make an effort. You know, people come out and express to us what they uh, think and feel. And, you know, I hear it in the grocery store. I hear it in the, at the doors. I hear it at community association meetings. It, it's, um, it's, there's many, many ways. And I'm glad we make a big effort to do that. My first question though, is about um, efficiencies and, you know, we, I was on uh, the radio the other morning explaining there's a working group at the city that will do sort of a combination of what the mayor had wanted, a line by line review of the budget, and what Councillor Brown had wanted in programs and services review. So, how, how can we be more efficient? At the same time, there's uh, what the mayor is, I don't think we have an official name for it, but the mayor's innovation and technology table, which will be the opportunity for uh, the companies from our special economic district, there's 540 uh, tech companies out in Canada, Invest Ottawa, Hydro Ottawa, the two universities, our two colleges to come and help the city uh, solve some of its problems. So it's taking shape in that it may be the city comes to the to the table and says, here's one of our problems. Uh, what does all the brain power in Ottawa think about that? Um, maybe from a technology standpoint, but maybe from others, other standpoints. So my general question is, given all that will be going on for the between now and the 2024 budget, what do you think the police involvement will be in that efficiencies review process, um, it, either involved in it or at, at the same time in tandem with their own um, budget? I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that right now. Thank you, uh, Member Curry. Um, in regards to active um, participation in the review, certainly when um, um, when we're approached by the city uh, as part of that review, we will uh, participate in it. I will uh, 
um, hand off to uh, to Deputy Bell to uh, to expand on that um, a little bit more. But I know internally, in terms of the efficiency efforts here of what we're trying to do, we we have uh, embarked on a lot of different uh, projects prior to me getting here. And as it's continuing into uh, into this coming year, you know, we are looking at uh, and actually one of the delegates. Um, you know, talked about uh, how expensive, uh, you know, police officers are, and they are, they are expensive. Um, we're, we are looking at what can we civilianize into a, a civilian member instead of a sworn member in some of our roles. And we've, uh, we've looked at that already, you know, at the front desk, um, we're looking at other options that, uh, that we could consider. Do we really need uh, a fully trained police officer um, uh, doing you know, these roles? We have special constables, we have uh, civilianized uh, members as well that we're looking at. Um, we also look at, you know, when we have X uh, goal or project that we need, do we have, um, do it, does it need to be a police officer to do that? And can we outsource, can we get a consultant? Can we get, can we outsource it? Um, so it's only a two or three month uh, push that, uh, that we can uh, uh, attach to that one person instead of it being a police officer. And then there is, of course, those service reductions as well, too, that we have to consider. Um, is there areas we just have to quit doing something because the demands are are um, are on us in other areas? So I know there there are different things that we are looking at, but uh, Steve, perhaps I'll go to you in regards to our participation with the city hall. Yeah, um, thanks, Councillor Curry. So uh, Chief covered a lot of um, the the things we're going to be looking at through our own service review. We're not going to be directly aligned. Uh, with the service review being conducted by the city, because that's specifically around city de departments. But that being said, I've already been in contact with the treasurer, uh, with the city manager to have discussions about how they're rolling that out and what's the process they're going to use to approach it. And we're going to look to adopt that here. Uh, one of the things I will say is we've done considerable number of efficiency reviews over the past number of years that have looked at our back office supports, that have looked at making sure our, our line by line and costing is actually as close to the actuals um, that we have year over year to make sure that our fleet is as tightly aligned as possible. That actually gives us the ability to start in this service review to look at the actual services we're delivering. Uh, as you saw, 83% of our budget is compensation. So we need to make sure that we're spending those in absolutely the best way we can. So uh, this service will review will, as the chief indicated, look at identifying services within, the, within the, the OPS to make sure that we have the right people doing those jobs. So the chief talked about many of the mechanisms that we'll look at, but we're actually truly going to be taking a look at uh, all of the different service delivery options we have, make sure they're the right ones, and then make sure we have the right people doing it. And that's will be the work we're going to undertake based on the framework that the city has suggested. Great, that's excellent. I would just, I, I'm really glad to hear you're, you know, you'll be open to whatever, but the, the some of the conversations that may come out of the innovation and technology table may focus on smart cities. So I just would, you know, I definitely police need to be there listening and then giving input as to what that really means and how that would affect your life to change things like that. Uh, the other, just the technology, you know, one of the significant parts of this budget is about our, our upgrading technology. And you know what that looks like all over the world because some of those companies uh in the tech park they are working with services all over the world you know obviously all over ontario and canada but all over the world so i just think there's a lot of uh you know untapped knowledge out there that uh, hopefully we'll be able to get at in, in a lot of our conversations over the next uh, year so that was one of my questions the other one was the the you heard from the delegations about the proportion of the city budget and the concept that our budget is going down you know, we heard from Councillor Brockington, so, and we had that discussion about not enough uh, uh, officers in our, in, in our NRPs. So the city's budget increases because we have more property taxpayers. We have more property taxpayers because we have more neighborhoods, more roads, more extension of the urban boundary that, you know, in their official plan, we asked for a small ex extension of the urban boundary. The province added in, you know, hundreds of hectares. That is uh, a lot for a city, and yet our police services budget as a percentage of the city budget goes down. So you can look at one stat or another, but fundamentally, our police services budget is not keeping up with the growth of the city. And when I'm listening to people outside the city core say, you know, our response times, we call the police and someone, well, fire, I don't mean to just point at police, but fire, ambulance, 
uh, police don't arrive for 30 minutes. You know, what I hear is that's not acceptable. And as our city grows geographically, it's already enough for five police forces. Uh, why would our budget be decreasing year after year? So I just wondered about an overall comment on that because we had a number of delegations that highlighted that, that it's confusing for people. Chief? Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Member Curry. You know, I certainly wouldn't want to, um, you know, send a message that our budget is decreasing because, of course, I don't, I don't believe anybody is saying that. It's simply because, I mean, it is. We're we're going at, we're we're trying to get five point two million dollar uh, more of an increase. But it is again that overall, that overall uh, budget um, percentage of budget of the of the overall city budget. I. You know, the demands of, of what I've seen, you know, in, in my short time, and I made a number of comments at, uh, I believe it was the January board meeting, just some of my observations. And and I I, I do just see, you know, that population growth that, uh, and, you know, it, ta it talks to sort of that rationale for the, the cell facility to go as well, too. We are growing. It's a growing community, and we have to grow with it as well, too. And it, it appears to me that we haven't in, in recent years kept pace and now we're trying to catch up. We had one year where we didn't grow at all and there was a budget freeze and, and that takes a long time for us to sort of make up some of that time. But, you know, when I look on those demands, uh, you know, and again, it's cyber crime, it's road safety, um, it's hate crimes, it's violence against women. And, and again, a, a number of our counselors who want more presence and uh, proactive. And again, I talk about that proactive work um, from our neighborhood resource teams and our frontline members. Um, they, they need that space to do that, but there's so many demands on them that they, they can't find that, that proactive, that free, unallocated time um, to do that work. And it's so important, and that's what drives down crime. That's what builds up relationships is when you have these members that aren't going from call to call. And, uh, and you know, of course, you know, that, that, that sort of that anchor that kind of brings down a lot of that work that we're trying to do is, is those major events and those protests that we have to manage. And it... Um, and that's not that's not decreasing. That's not going away. So we need to we need to find a way to try to manage that big chunk of work that we have to uh, that we have to do day in and day out. Um, and, but at the same time, we really need to deliver for those that that vast geographic area and and the, the so many differences in all these different neighborhoods that that we have in Ottawa. Um, it really is, and that's why that neighborhood resource team is so important, because what is a priority in one neighborhood, a kilometer to the east, west, south, or north, can be completely different, and we need to be responsive for that. So uh, to do that, we, do, we just need, um, uh, we need that ability, we need that investment to keep pace with, um, with all that. And, and just to maybe just comment briefly on the innovation and the IT side, um, you, you want to be a, a police force, we want to have a service that is um that is keeping up with technology that is uh, that has and it, it can't be the latest and greatest of every toy because that, that's impossible to keep up with but you know we had that uh, modernization roadmap um that had a significant dollar value attached to it to try to get us to that level where we're very competitive if you will um, with some of the other police agencies like york and peel that that uh that have invested a lot of money and i'm not criticizing the decision to stop that when it did um the reasons therein were made um but um that that was three years ago that it was stopped and we just need to now pick up we have to pick that that where we left off and try to advance something that that path didn't work um, um so now we have to find that other path and we need to work with uh, with city hall with um, those that know this business very well in terms of um uh, modernizing our, our police force so we can keep pace. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I wondered if CAO had any other further comment on that, CAO Bell? Uh, in terms of the um, IT specifically, absolutely. Um, we've uh, we've actually started the work, as the Chief indicated, to look at a, a multi-year plan that we will be starting to introduce in future budgets to make sure that we have uh, the most up-to-date, stable, safe, and contemporary IT system to help support our operations. This year, we have, we've actually focused in on um, our digital information and evidence management system, uh, a review and uh, augmentation of our cybersecurity programming, as well as our data analytics. And that's really where our focus will be, and that's what you're seeing represented in this budget. 
But as the chief said, that's the first step in what needs to be a multi-year plan. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to hear about your interest, Member Curry, around the innovation uh, work that's being done within the city. We're absolutely going to be linking into that to look at how we can leverage that, as well as their experience in building their IT capacity. So uh, a major area of focus for us and something that we'll continue to build and report on to the Thank you very much. I have one more question before, and I'll just let everybody else go after me. Just one other thing I want to ask. So, um, and I went over this within my in, in my individual ward meeting. The if the police services budget uh, goes over, the city has to pay for it anyways, right? So, but it's always been the case that the the police work very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. But I guess I want to know as a board member, what are the risks here um, that our budget we may not meet this budget if if we end up having to spend more. And then how will we know as a board how we're doing as we go along? Do you want me to answer that, Chief, or do you want to start? Um, maybe I'll start, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Stephen. I'll, I'll pass it over to you. The uh, you know Throughout the year, and again, I maybe a bit of an education piece for me, but I, uh, I would expect that we would give um, the board, so if not monthly, but quarterly updates on our financial yes. state uh, throughout the fiscal year, the calendar year in this case, and uh, and give our projections of what we have spent and what uh, and what risks have um, have occurred and uh, and obviously you know last year with the convoy and whatnot um, I'm sure after the first quarter into April the uh, the the financial update wasn't good, uh, very good in terms of what we spent but the hope of uh, the federal um, funding to to help us out and I think that's what. Uh, um, that's what we need to do in terms of communication is being very transparent. Um, there's always some delays in terms of what we've spent, but there's a lot of controllable things that we can, uh, that, that we go through every year, salaries and whatnot. And then there's a lot of uncontrollables in terms of serious events that might occur. Uh, we're on homicide number three, unfortunately, already, as I mentioned uh, this year, those are very costly. Um, and depending on how those investigations go, they can be wrapped up within a month or two, or some of them can be uh, multi-month or multi-year. I use that just as a small example of uh, some of the uncontrollable environment that we that we do live in, and that's why it's important to have those uh, regular communications with the board uh, to express where our pressures are throughout the year. Uh, over to you, Steve. Thanks, uh, Chief. So, yeah, as the chief indicated, we provide uh, quarterly reporting to the board. Um, this is an anomaly year for us because we're already halfway through Q1 and still in the deliberations around the budget. And mm -hmm. I think a great example is. Uh, Chair Valiquet's um, question, because that's immediately a pressure that we need to actually start to examine on our existing budget. So um, we've done over the last 10 years, six years, we've actually come in uh, on, on budget or moderately uh, moderate surplus, never a large surplus, but a moderate surplus. Uh, in four years, we've actually hit a deficit where we go to the city, let them know that we aren't going to be able to make our year end. And uh, they, they provide us uh, from reserve funding the difference within our budget. We work very, very hard through the year to make sure that we don't have to go at the end of the year to the city to for them to cover a deficit. And we work with them on an ongoing basis. Um, govern, the governance around the budget and financial reporting to this board is something I'm very happy to have a discussion about to make sure that we're hitting uh, the reporting cycle, providing the information and metrics that this board is looking for so they can evaluate where we are on target towards our budget. All right. Thank you very much for that. I'll, I'll uh, take a break here now. All right. Thank you. Member Carr. Hi, thank you. Um, of course, I'm not on this uh, this committee, but I did just have a couple questions, and I apologize if they've been asked uh, recently as a new member. Um, uh, I was interested in the, the discussion and the question that, that came from one of the delegates with respect to, um, well, it came as a result of one of the delegates with respect to advocating to the province um, with respect to paid suspension. One of the things that I often hear, and, and we hear a lot about, is uh, that the police directing traffic, a lot of resources are spent directing traffic, and it's my understanding that those responsibilities fall under the Highway Traffic Act and include things such as, you know, Santa Claus parades. And I was just wondering if the OPS has done any advocacy um, to the province to change that legislation or get anything of, of that sort changed. That's my first question. Okay, over to you, Chef. 
Thank you, uh, Member Carr. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, just, in, in terms of that historical side, I, uh, I'll, I'll pass over to uh, either to uh, Deputy Bell or Ferguson if, uh, or, or Burnett if they, if they know that answer, or maybe even uh, John might know. Um, I will say this, it's been my observation as well too, as we, um, we have a lot of demands for our members, um, say for overtime, um, be it um, you know, for shortages on the front line, for protests, et cetera. And then these paid duties um, that, that we have where we contract our services out, um, say to, for, the, for the Ottawa Senators or Blue Fest or uh, you know, construction sites or you know, on the roads and whatnot. And some of that, as I understand, is legislated and some of that, um, you know, we, uh, we have that obligation to, uh, um, uh, to assist. But sometimes we do say no with some requests. That's not always yes. We do turn down some groups because we just simply don't have the resources. But in terms of that lobbying or that ask, I, um, I'm not sure, uh, Deputy Bell, if you want to look at that one. Yeah, thanks, Chief. So what I can let you know is there's been discussion um, around that over a number of years. I don't mm -hmm. think it's made any sort of substantive traction in terms of having that legislation opened up and, and amended. Uh, that's something we continue to have discussions. Uh, the chief has discussions with OACP, Ontario Associations of Chiefs of Police around to look at how we can further uh, that area, further that legislative change. What I will say, though, is what you're speaking to is... Um, is exactly what I'm what I was discussing in that service review. We need to even even around the legislative bounds that exist, there are areas that we can look at providing different services. And that's where we're committed to actually taking a, a look and providing those more efficient services in areas like uh, traffic control that may fall outside of the legislation, um, in areas like scene management. So we are going to look at that while we continue to lobby to have those, that legislation change, because I think there's some belt tightening we can do there while we wait for the long process of legislative change. Thank you. Do I still have time, uh, Chair, to ask yes, a go, more questions? Yes, go ahead. Absolutely. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, obviously, in the last couple of weeks, one question um, that's come up is the expenditure of the, the South facility. This was, of course, received project and expenditure authority, and then it was frozen. And, and recently uh, the board approved for the facility strategy refresh to go ahead. And, and question uh, that I have, you know, you talk a lot about modernization. Um, I know we're losing the, the, the Leitrim and, and the Green Bank facility, um, but questions about whether or not, you know, the need for police services with respect to facilities. There was a suggestion that came up in a discussion. I was recently involved with other councillors where it was asked, you know, the need for actual facilities, um, would modernization not uh, allow more of a, a hybrid approach where you're not so dependent on hybrid facilities? And I'm wondering, um, CAO Bell, if you can speak a little bit to that need for facilities with um, policing. Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Member Carr. So um, we're a service industry. Uh, the, the pandemic is... Um, as we came in and managed through it, allowed us to find opportunities to uh, manage the number of people we have in the office, to look at remote working we've, uh, and hybrid working. I think we've, uh, we've done very well in that area and found some efficiencies. But at the end of the day, the, the, the core of what we do, core of the service we deliver requires members to retrieve equipment, um, get into vehicles and then respond to different locations across the city to provide service to the public. Uh, in that, if we don't want to be spending an excessive amount of time wasted for those members to provide that service in travel, we need to be appropriately geographically located across the city. As we've looked uh, through the facility strategic plan starting in 2014, we identified two primary growth areas, one being the west, and that's why we built Huntmar first, and now the south, and that's why we're looking at the Prince of Wales location. If you look at any future projection maps of uh, where the city's going to grow the most, it is in that south area. We've yeah. selected South to be able to best align the resources with the equipment that they'll need to be able to deliver the service. And it, it is not, uh, it's not our current practice or intended practice to ever have 
our members take mark police vehicles to their residence uh, and all store all their equipment there to then deploy from that location. That's not the service model we have. That's not the model that I think is the responsible one to develop and deliver. So in that, we're going to need facilities like South to be able to deploy our resources. Okay, thank you. I think I'll leave my third question and I'll just comment that uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, hearing conversations about in the future to have uh, more performance metrics and, and uh, your comments, CAO Bell, on uh, governance as we go forward. But uh, thank you very much for answering my questions. Thank you, Member Carr. I see that uh, DC Burnett's hand is up. <laughs> Was that okay? All um, right. So Let me lower that then. Sorry about <laughs> okay. that. No problem. Um, I, so I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind, Member Curry. Um, can you elaborate more on how you plan to achieve the 520,000 520, efficiencies target through professional services reductions? Uh, what is no longer occurring to free up this money? Is this a reoccurring efficiency or is it a one time for 2023? Steve, I'll let you uh, take that one. Yeah, thanks, Chief. Um, so, Chair, what we've done is we've gone through, uh, as part of every budget exercise, we do uh, a line-by-line -line review with all of our different superintendents and executive directors in all of in all of the different directorates. Uh, mm -hmm. In that, what we've identified this year is areas where we expended professional services budget um, that could be translated into FTEs within the organization. So. Okay. We've scrubbed, scrubbed through based on actuals. I, I don't have in front of me right now the exact account, accounts that they're coming from, but those reviews identified that um, we could find those 500, 500, about $500,000 in efficiencies and reinvest them into internal FTEs. So I okay. will get the overall accounts that they're coming from and provide them to you, but it's based on a line by line review. Okay, so that kind of leads into my next one. When you compare the total FTEs for 2022 and 2023 on pages 106 and 107 of the budget book, it shows an increase in complement of actually 29. However, we said we were growing by 25, I believe, 20 sworn and five civilians. So can, can this be further explained? Yes, Is absolutely. So as part of as part of that review that we've had, we found right. internal financial efficiencies that are better going to be more efficiently invested into those positions. That's why you're seeing an FTE growth of 29, whereas the budgeted amount we need to grow by uh, only needs to comp cover those 25 positions. OK. All right. And uh, I thought I saw reductions in some areas related to provincial grant funding. Are we receiving the same level of grant funding from the province in 2023 that we received in 2022? Sorry, I couldn't get off mute there. Um, so uh, I, I will get you a detailed breakdown on all of the grant funding. What I can tell you is uh, on a yearly basis, we apply for a variety of grant fundings. Um, we have consistent funding in this year's budget that we did to last year, but that doesn't mean that we can't grow that through the year. Most of the funding commitments we have are uh, either one-time purchases or multi-year funding for program delivery. And we are always right. looking at those and looking to apply. So we haven't decreased in the last year. And our okay. hope is that funding opportunities will come that we'll be able to increase that funding. Perfect. And my last question is on page 28 in the second paragraph, where we talk about the safe workplace office that opened in October 2022, which I commend you on that. I think that's one of the best initiatives that has come out uh, last year. You have two investigators and one administrator right now. And in 2023, you're looking at hiring uh, a mediation, uh, adding a mediation position plus a psychologist. Uh, as I say, commendable initiative. I look forward to its progress. Where in the budget, however, does the uh, Safe Workplace Office appear? Which directorate uh, and who do they report to? Go ahead, Steve. They report to you. Uh, well, okay, thank you. They report to you. So actually where you'll find, so um, again, uh, uh, 
program, as the chief said many, many times, a program we're very proud of having implemented. We look forward to further briefing the board uh, on the work we're doing around that. And I think that's at a, comes at a really timely and necessary point right now. Uh, in terms of the budget, the, uh, the Safe Workplace Office actually reports directly through to the chief. So the budget, any budget allocated to that comes out of and is captured in the office of the chief. Uh, okay. All right. Thanks very much. I see your hand up again. Member Curry, please go ahead. Thank you. Just a couple of other questions. Um, in the budget, we see uh, $600,000 for uh, new investments in cybercrime, uh, affirming our commitment to address violence against women and femicide and prioritizing relationships with indigenous communities. At the same time, we have a comment in the budget that we lost 6 million or 600,000 from taking away the user fees, right? So we made that decision as a board, as you yep. will, some of you will recall. Yep. Um, so you kind of see that offset. H had we not done that, we wouldn't need to have new money to uh, work on some of our high priority initiatives. Um, but that's what we decided. We wanted volunteers to be able to, you know, get their police checks done and not have to pay. And this was critical. So, but I guess my question is like cities, we only have so many ways of bringing in money, right? And one of them is user fees. Is there, are there any um, discussions, I guess, that will be coming up as to where else we could, you know, charge somebody money for a fee. I mean, the city's always looking at that, right? Whether it's for a dog tag or some amount of money that, you know, a little bit from everybody increases uh, our revenues. So I wonder if that's coming up at all, if we will see that. I mean, this translates into $17 on, on everyone's tax bill, not everyone, all property taxpayers. But for the user fee route of, of bringing in res, re, revenues, what um, when are we going to talk more about that? Mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I haven't put my mind to that, uh, Member Curry, in terms of where we could generate more revenue. There's always been in my head those sort of obvious uh, paths, and you mentioned one of, um, uh, you know, of the, of the criminal record checks and whatnot. I, I, I personally haven't uh, looked at a lot of revenue streams. I know there are a few. Um, um, I don't know if our CFO um, Hollis or uh, Deputy Bell want to uh, weigh into any other ideas there. So uh, as the chief said, we, we haven't, it's not an area that we've greatly explored, something we'd have discussion on. I, I think that mm -hmm. it's important to realize though, as a police service, we're not allowed to generate revenue. We can actually mm -hmm. generate cost recovery on services that we provide. So we can't go into a stream of business just for the purposes of making money. It has to be reflected on a cost recovery basis. Um, there are other areas that, that we could look at charging uh, fees. It's just not an area that we've actually really explored because uh, past boards haven't had a huge appetite for that. But it is a, a, a if it's something the board wanted us to explore and bring back to them, it is something we could ab absolutely undertake. I, I might mention. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I sorry to cut you off, America. I might mention that I I, I did ask about uh, you know when we contract our our members out for these paid duties. I did mm -hmm. pose the question of um, for argument's sake, uh, if we charge a hundred dollars an hour. Could we charge 150 uh, and just to, you know make some prop more uh, profit on this? But it is legislated in terms of what we can charge in terms of we just can't make money. We're not a for profit, so we can we can have a small administrative charge to uh, uh, to offset some of the the work behind the scenes that we do. But it is limited to what we can charge, just in that regard. Yeah, great. Well, that's good because I mean, cost recovery is cost recovery, right? So I mean, we'll, we'll have to look at what that actually means. And what are our costs for some of the things that we do that are over and above what is, you know, legislated? Anyway, something to talk about in future, I think. The other uh, last question I have is really on this alternate response. Um, a number of us sat and listened to the um, amazing people on the guiding council talk about all that they're trying to do. And, um, you know, I get, I get a number of emails from, from all kinds of different people about, uh, you know, the need for an alternate response. And I, I say in every response, you have to appreciate that the police agree, you know, like the police and the police services board agree there needs to be an alternate response. And we're not, nobody's arguing here about that. It's about who pays for it. And yeah. so my understanding is that the Toronto City Council pays for their entire pilot project and alternate response. It's not that it's coming from another first responders budget. Like that, that's I think what the disconnect is here. And I think if everyone 
you know, spent more time on that, city councilors included, that if it is that other city councils are paying for this work and this alternate response and alternate training and all the rest of it, why isn't city council? And I don't expect you to just answer that, but I guess I just wanted to know how familiar are we with what Toronto's actually doing and where the funding's coming from? That's an excellent question. And I think chief apropos for you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Member Curry for that question. And, and I'll just restate what you stated uh, at the beginning is that we are very supportive of um, looking for another structure, uh, another service delivery model where we can uh, send those that are better trained uh, to mental health calls, could be um, a check of well being, depending on the situation. So, full stop, no debate on that. Um, but again, there has to be a proper structure and model in place. And, and again, on a side note there as well, there are always going to be those types of calls where there's no doubt we have to be uh, involved based on the risk and we just can't send a civilian in by themselves. But you're absolutely right. That I, I, I tell you, I, I watched and read as much as I could and I do have intentions of um, getting more, we will get more details like in the weeds of what's going on in, uh, in Toronto. I was very surprised, very surprised at the 78% um, deferral rate that they achieved during their pilot. Um, that is uh, a lot higher number than I envisioned. So I'm, it was a pleasant surprise for me. Uh, honestly, if we got to 50%, you know, without the pilot, I, I would say that would be very good. Going higher than that is, is, is again, something that we're very supportive of. I do think this though, and it's a bit of um, a bit of an assessment again, in my time here of, of uh, less than three months, but I do sense that we need to apply more effort to establish an alternative service, uh, an alternative service delivery model here, in, uh, in in Ottawa, and and more effort, I think, from the police, more effort, I think, from City Hall, more effort from the community partners that we're dealing with. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done over the the, the uh, last couple of years. The guiding council being a big part of that, but I sense more urgencies may be needed, um, and that comes with uh, a group effort. And I'm not blaming anybody because we're in that we're in that group as well too. Um, that needs to, to to focus on this and and just I just don't see an imminent uh, path being established in 2023, for example. Um, so we are actually looking at um, we 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 went down this path, but then uh, because this was coming of hiring a, a mental health service worker and then putting them into our um, dispatch communication center that can assist. Uh, when we get these calls for service and we can have a mental health worker speak to a complainant or someone that's going through a crisis right away, better assess and triage what might be needed for that person. Uh, we're, we're just looking at doing that as a, as a gap um, until something uh, more is established. And maybe it'll continue even when that structure is there. I don't know, but that's something that we've just looked at in the last couple of weeks. And I know Deputy Ferguson is, uh, is, uh, is leading that charge uh, in that regard. Great. All great. I just will end with this and that you know, there was a comment made um, by one of the presenters about our own uh, psychological support staff for, you know, that's in our budget. And I guess I would say I'm actually um, worried that we don't have enough for our officers. There are people who are answering 911 calls who have to go through some of the trauma with the people who are calling. And those people need supports as well. And I, I feel like any kind of criticism of the police force spending money on psychological supports for their members is not helpful because it is actually critical that the people that we have helping other people are also very healthy. So Absolutely. make that comment as a closing. And I thank you all very much for everything here today. 100% member Curry, 100% agree with you. Salim, I saw your hand was up. Uh, that's okay, Madam Chair. I, yes, we've thank answered. You. Your answer was quite okay. Uh, thank you. All right. Well, um, I will now uh, ask that the Finance and Audit Committee receive the presentation and delegations for information and consideration. Is the item received? Received. Thank you very much. Is there any other business? None. Our next committee meeting date is to be determined. Uh, can I please have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Thank you very much. La date de notre prochaine réunion de comité reste à déterminer. Puis-je avoir une motion d'ajournement? Merci, uh, membre Curry. Thank you, everybody, for your time this morning. 
very helpful and very informative. So have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much.